Jim Lucas. I am a Global Director of Insights and Strategy at Anthem. And today we're going to talk about the contours of constraint. Um, and this is about how women uh, buy and how they sort of take account of things like healthiness, nutrition, well-being as they sort of go through this. This work stemmed from some work that was done by one of my colleagues, Kathy Aneto, where she had looked originally at um, what women want from health and wellness. And one of the big findings inside there, which really stemmed as a springboard for this, was the sort of contrast that people had uh, between what they wanted, wanted to do, sort of their motivations, and what they needed to do, sort of expectations. And so it was sort of that constraint that people had, uh, that women had between those two things that were really a key part of this. And that's sort of set off what we're going to talk about today. Um, just one further thing is we decided to look at two categories in order to look at how this sort of contra of constraints works when people are actually making purchase decisions. And really there's some two categories you're looking at. They're a little bit different and so therefore give us a pretty good notion of what the landscape is like. So the first one is nutrition and really has to do with food and beverages and how you're trying to make nutritional choices inside there. Um, we're going to contrast that with facial skin care which is uh, a little bit less frequent purchase. And you can think about a couple other things that are different between those two kinds of purchases, the kinds of shopping trip that people are likely to be doing with those, or even the retailers are likely most likely to be going to these places to take a look at these products inside. Also, if you think about it, at a very basic level, they're different. Think about food, it's really difficult in one sense to evaluate um, how effective it is in terms of health and wellness in any short term, uh, and it's an internal thing. If you think about facial skin care, it's something that's a little bit more external in terms of it, so probably more optics will be playing a role in terms of how people uh, can evaluate them. So uh, let me dive into this now so I can uh, make most use out of everyone's time. So we look at the food category. One of the things that's kind of interesting, it starts to set up this juxtaposition between sort of expectations and motivations from the get-go is you see that 65% of the women feel that they should eat healthier. Another 78% of the women say, I make choices to benefit my health and wellness. And I think this is where we start to see the first forms of some of the contrast between these two things, between the expectations that are things that are sort of external, things that you need to do versus things that are uh, motivations, which are internal things that you want to do. And you can see from the, the get-go that, that there is this onus where people do feel that they should be eating better. So one of the questions that starts to come from that almost immediately is then how do you decide on this? How do you sort of make sure that you can balance all the right kinds of constraints, those things that are your motivations as well as the things that are expectations? And one of the things we wanted to think about that uh, another layer on top of this is that inside the store, when you're trying to make some kinds of purchase decisions, one of the things that happens is when you go to the shelf or when you're on a shopping trip, especially for food, there are lots of choices and there's a lot of uh, other considerations that go into it in addition to healthiness. And there's a lot of opacity as well at the shelf. So it's, a, it's a, an ideal setting to look at how people are making these decisions. So one of the things that we've seen here that's kind of a fascinating part of this to me is if we look at the food category and, and how people start to think inside the store, one of the questions we could ask ourselves is how do people make decisions about healthiness? How do they decide if a food is healthy or nutritious? And as we went in and talked to women, we did this in a couple of different ways. We did it from our survey, we did some qualitative, we also did some uh, mobile eye tracking studies with you know, interviews at the back of them. We began to realize that there, there were a couple of constraints on, on how they made choices. And the four top ones were really price, taste, convenience, and health. And health is it's not exactly in order, but it's pretty close. And what we'd see is that if people, you know, could go through all these kinds of things and try to decide which is a good choice, they would evaluate those first. So example might be if you're looking at something like kale, and I'm going to prepare kale from the produce department, and I know it's a really healthy choice, there are probably a couple other things that start to work in there, like, is it something that my family is going to like, or is it something I'm going to like in terms of taste? And the second of all, it's about convenience. How much work am I going to have to go through to, to sort of do this, uh, to, to create this food? And I think that th this also starts to come out if you think about if you're not only yourself, but 
you know that you know most women are smart enough to know they, they've developed these whole uh, pragmatic strategies around this to know that taste is really a, a key part of this and so if it's not something that's going to taste well the chances are it won't get eaten and therefore it could be a way so when you're looking at these choices inside the store most women are, are looking at multiple dimensions when they're trying to evaluate something so health is one of the considerations even though they know that they should eat healthier or they believe they should eat healthier um, but it, you know it has to be balanced against some of the other things that they are are indeed uh, charged with doing. Let me use a couple examples here to sort of bring this to life. So one of the things we're going to talk about here is that women have developed a lot of practical shortcuts. Uh, maybe you could call that heuristics. That's one of the terms that sort of behavioral scientists and cognitive psychologists use to talk about this. But when they try to evaluate foods, one of the questions we said is, how do you know something's healthy? And so a couple of different examples have started to pop up where you'd see that people will look at the natural ingredients they see in there, or they'll look for ingredients that have a, are free from, so it might be gluten-free or dairy-free, etc. Or clean or simple lab labeling. So if I got a short ingredient list, the one that I can understand uh, makes a lot of sense to, to make it a little bit easier. And then there's a sort of a fourth thing we're talking about, we'll call it better for you, which is we'll just require a little bit of explanation, but I think you'll sort of get an idea. But what these uh, all these practical shortcuts really started to create is they re create a balance of the constraints, but also a way for people to meaningfully, easily manage this when they're inside the store. So if you look over on the right there, one of, one of the numbers I've quoted here from our study is that 60% of people agree that when I see products labeled as all natural, I think it's healthy. I think one of the things about this that's really key is that you can see even though most people see that, not everybody does. So people know from the get-go that this is shortcut, and again, shortcuts do have their own sort of dangers. Other point I wanted to make at this at this juncture before we just talk about a couple examples here is that, in general, what we've seen is that people who do deploy these kinds of strategies to look at things like labeling uh, are actually, on average, about nine pounds lighter than than women who don't look at and regularly read labels. So. It seems like it's a great incentive for one to sort of go out there and start your diet right away. Um, and I think it's because it starts to infuse somebody with a whole kind of mindset as you go through. So two examples we look at in terms of uh, what I'll call clean labeling. Both of them are from the yogurt category. And so you can see Yo, Yo Play Simplay. Okay, uh, is an interesting example. It's just six ingredients. Okay, and here it's sort of the equation that they're creating. The value equation is natural, simple, premium equals good. On the other hand, here we have Dan and Pure, which is again a similar kind of uh, product where it has between seven and eight ingredients depending upon which flavor it is. Again, natural, simple, and value. So what we see is that the Yo Play is usually priced a little bit more than the other Yo Play yogurts, while Pure is priced a little bit less. And I think what you take from this in both cases is you can see that there's a simplistic, uh, there's a simplistic ingredients uh, message here that's playing well. Um, in one case, there's a value message plus the, in the other case, there's a premium message, which sort of give people a way to sort of sort through this. And what we've seen is that this is one of the key in key uh, shortcuts that women are using nowadays if they look at clean labeling, simple labeling, ingredients that they can easily identify. You don't have to be a food scientist or a nutritionist to be able to read uh, the ingredients on the side of the packing. So those are all key things that are starting to go into some of these um, shortcuts that people are using. So the first one, again, we talked about it as an example here is clean labeling. Second example, which is kind of an interesting one, is a category of, of how people approach this, especially women, in terms of what we'll call better for you. Okay, so if you look at the top, you'll see this weird equation which says better for you is actually less good for you than good for you. So the notion here is that um, if you think about good for you, so you thought about beverage, maybe good for you is water. That's probably the thing that's really the best for you to drink. But I don't like water. It's boring to drink water all the time. And so what I might then look for is an alternative that is not quite as good as water, but not quite as bad as some of the other things. So I might say, in this case, I'm looking at Sprite Select, which has a third fewer calories. I can say, yeah, it's not as boring as water, but it's not as bad as going for a full tilt soda. So I think what we're seeing here is it started to create an interesting way of logic, that you will, that, that people employ, especially women, when they're looking at food products. So there's not a single dimension on which they're looking. They don't have complete information about all these things, and they have many things to balance. So what you'll see is that as we go through and we continue to do this, what we're seeing is that 
um, the, the better for you is an interesting solution to what goes on here. The Sprite Select case is, a, is, a, is another one that's sort of, uh, it's an interesting example that points to one other thing we see that's going on there. So you see that it says naturally sweetened at the bottom, right? And I think one of the challenges with this comes from the fact that we're not sure what exactly natural means in this case because it's it's done with stevia, right? So if you think about it, stevia or nectrice or some of the new kind of natural sweeteners, people aren't exactly sure about them yet. So don't know if it's good or bad, but it's I think it's one of the things we're starting to see where people will start to develop new uh, ways to look at this stuff and how they're going to interpret things like those natural sweeteners. So just to, to recap, um, in terms of the food category, what we're seeing is that in, as we've looked at this, and I've only used a couple examples here, but I, I wanted to sort of um, set some of these things the right way, um, is it's less about persuasion and it's more about providing uh, shoppers, consumers with a platform that allows them to achieve something. Okay? And we've seen this for women in, in a lot of different categories inside the food and beverage when they're thinking about things like nutrition. Um, you think about how things like the Special K challenge have evolved over time. So again, it's, it's working quite well. Uh, second thing is that we've seen that, you know, probably want to focus on the most important benefit or reason to believe in a clear telegraphic manner. Okay? That sounds fairly basic, but one of the challenges we have when somebody's standing at the store shelf is precisely that. They, there's a lot of choice that they're confronted with there, and I think trying to get across your message, whether it's through the packaging or it's through signage or something else like that, is really critical in terms of trying to uh, be very clear and make it easy for shoppers to pick this. And then finally at the bottom we said in what we'll call mouse type, no weasel phrases. So I think one of the other challenges that we must you know, be, be clear about when we're going through is if we're providing shoppers with a telegraphic or a shortcut way information has to be useful, it has to be valuable to them. And so if we introduce weasel phrases, and i.e. I, phrases that you know really don't mean a lot or phrases, phrases that are probably somewhat dubious in what they're saying, we start to muddy the waters. And so I think it's, it's important for us to um, really set this the right way, set this tone the right way we're going forward. So a couple of you know findings and, uh, if you will, uh, takeaways from the food category. All right, I'm going to turn to the beauty category, and you can easily say from looking at the at the at my picture in the corner there, what do I know about beauty? Well, I've studied it a lot. It hasn't really had an impact on my appearance. I still have a face that's made for radio, so I apologize. Um, I can't do much about that. But as we look at the beauty category, one of the things that is, is fascinating about this is if you think about it, increasingly women are embracing the relationship between good health and wellness and beauty. And there are a lot of sources for this. You think about some of the things that uh, Oprah was doing when she talked about women and sort of embrace your skin. Uh, you think about the stuff that Dove has done in the past. And so we've started to see more and more that there's a, it's not just about appearance, but it's about an overall wellness and beauty that women are starting to make this connection. And I think it's a, it's a great, great thing. Uh, the way women shop for beauty products is different than food, not surprisingly, because it's more personally involving. It's something that's less infrequent. It's uh, more expensive than food. Um, and really, in a sense, it's, a, it's about a presentation of the self that's probably more visible than, than food generally is. Um, also, the other thing that's going on there is you see that beauty and the science behind it are changing at breakneck speed. And what women like about this is the fact that this continues to offer opportunities or hopes or new solutions for their problems. What they don't like about it is the fact that it's difficult to know what to look for, so you have to keep updated. And if you look to the right there, two, two facts about this probably bear not only why this is different from food, but why it sort of works in a slightly different way is that we see that only about 30 percent of women read uh, carefully read packaging when we talk about beauty products or we think about skincare products. So much less likely to read it and you know it's not as easy to read. But the other part of it is that a lot more of this information is probably coming from, you know, you can say word of mouth or social media where people are trying to understand from either colleagues, friends, family members, you know, what kinds of things are working or, you know, what other people are seeing inside there. So a lot of complexity. Uh, women are trying to find ways to sort of break through that complexity to make a, a decision that allows them to pick the right product for them. So when we look at it, you know, we shouldn't judge beauty uh, by it, you know, a book by its cover, but unfortunately part of what we have to do in the, in the beauty category is exactly that. Um, 
but I think one of the challenges inside here, if you think about it, is reading a skincare products label often seems like you need a, a degree, an advanced degree, in chemical engineering. Uh, because I think that some of the things that are inside there are very difficult for most of us to understand on a regular basis. And what we've seen is that it, it, generally women are pretty well informed about, um, you know, what their skin is like. Okay, men would be much less likely to understand, you know, which category they fall into, what their skin is about, or what their skin issues are they're trying to drive. But women know this. They know what kinds of signs they're looking for. So if it's aging, they know there's seven signs of aging, or they know that they're looking for something that's going to help them with age spots, or they know that there's something that's going to help them with um, wrinkles or dark spots or whatever. So they've got a pretty good idea of what they're trying to look for. Also, beforehand, before they go to the store, they'll often do a lot of work to generally know what they're looking for from products. So there's not really a, 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 a challenge. The challenge, though, there's not a challenge in terms of searching for these things, but the challenge really exists at the shelf. We can see to the right there, um, you know, there's typically something like 500 or 600 SKUs, and you're looking at the shelf on products like... Um, facial skin care. So it's it's a daunting task. Um, but, you know, the, the, again, what we see is that it's, it's become uh, practical for women to employ shortcuts when they go through the anti-aging category as well or the skin care category because there's so many things on the shelf and it's rapidly changing and, you know, the science isn't totally transparent to them. Now, just to talk about a couple of things that We've seen out there, um, and we've done this a couple of ways, where we've looked at um, examples from the store. So some of these are, are not packaging, but they might be POS um, or some other parts of the path to purchase that people are utilizing. But one of the things we started to see uh, that works quite well is a visualization of benefits. And by far the hands down, hands on, hands down, sorry, the best uh, example that we have is from Clinique. And the Stark Spot Corrector and Brightening Essence um, have worked quite well. We've done um, you know, eye tracking studies all over. We talk to people from Latin America, Europe, South America, um, as well as uh, Asia Pacific and Europe. So we've done a, a pretty good spectrum of, of people and it's, it's easy for people to understand what this is about. So the beauty of the sort of approach in terms of visualization of benefits is that it's very telegraphic about what it does and you know, it doesn't require a lot of work on the part of the consumer, they get it right away. So one of the things we really like, this is a great way to sort of simplify some of the communications that are going on inside the, the facial skin care area. Um, other thing we're starting to see, kind of interesting, is some different approaches. So here um, we see something that was done by Olay, which the, with their new uh, Total Effects, one of their new Total Effects product, right? If you look at it, what they've done here is they've leveraged new language. So um, while I'm not in the category as heavily as I probably should be, uh, things like BB, which are, you know, are relatively recent things to the category. So, you know, um, Blemish Bomb or Beauty Bomb um, started largely in Asia Pacific and sort of migrated to, to, the, uh, to the West. What we've seen here, if you look at the, this uh, ad actually for Olay, is it sort of does a really good job of playing on this, and they've sort of to create a new language. So anti-aging plus beauty bomb equals CC, which is, you know, color correcting, um, you know, cream. So it's got a new benefit inside there. It's sort of leveraging some of the other things, but it, it probably requires a little bit of learning on the part of consumers, but it seems to be pretty easy. This is a print ad, though, so it's an, an easy thing sort of to spend a little bit more time on. When we looked at the same thing, the same product, if you will, inside the store, so this is, you know, usually it's called the product box or product display, what we saw is that they were, consumers were very much focused on a couple of pieces of this uh, puzzle. So there's much less time to go inside there to, to look at this. So the part of what we need to think about is holistically, if you think about the path to purchase or the ecosystem that shoppers are going through when they approach the skin care purchase, let's say, is we need to understand that these different elements in there or different parts or touch points inside there played slightly different roles. And so at the shelf, what we don't we don't need to show everything, but we probably need to give them some cues that, you know, uh, how they can start to make some choices. So that's probably one of the differences between, you know, same product treated through a magazine ad, but also in, uh, in, in store. So it starts to give you some ideas of how uh, women are starting to think about um, you know, the store and, and the role it plays vis-a-vis -vis the other things they are looking for in terms of their path to purchase. 
Another thing that seems to work pretty well in terms of the category, and again, we look at, you know, we've looked at a lot of trends insider, but it plays well to women is, you know, uh, the notion of simplifying their routine. So the work we've done is that, that with women has shown us that, um, you know, women usually have a morning and an AM and a PM skin routine. Usually the, the PM skin routine is a little bit more complex. I also know that women tend to switch out their routines fairly regularly. So some of it's seasonal, but some of it also comes from as, uh, as they incorporate new products into their um, routine. What we're seeing here, the kind of interesting thing about Olay is uh, that they have, you know, tried to help simplify. So multifunctional products are one of the key things that we're seeing as a, as a way to, to help simplify some of this process. Uh, and one of the, the last categories, or one of the last products I wanted to look at inside the beauty category, you know, really is about optical proof. So this is probably the, the most robust of these. So we've seen one that was done by L'Oreal and uh, Olay Pro X, where, you know, you can see results in eight weeks, or you can see results uh, in the case of L'Oreal, where it's as little as one week, and then if you look at another four weeks, you'll start to see some, some results. So what it starts to do is it sort of provides optical proof inside here. So it, it's an easy way for people to, you know, sort of grapple with what they should be seeing inside here. So we're seeing in terms of messages then, in terms of the kinds of shortcuts that women are using for beauty, you know, they're looking at things like um, what this does with my regimen. They're looking for ways to understand if this is affecting, uh, having an effect on them. You know, they're looking for ways in which um, people can, um, they're looking for ways in which products can, you know, help them with new ways to approach old problems. So trying to go through all these things, what we're seeing is, I think, is that there are really two main factors that are uh, reshaping the contours of constraint when you think about the beauty category and specifically skincare here. First, it's sort of the fluid, ever-changing uh, nature of beauty products. Um, and if you think about that, it really demands that shoppers need to be provided with an up-to-date lexicon or uh, cheat sheet of what to look for. Uh, so what's big one week is is not necessarily hot in the next week. So you can see that there are there are some things there that really make a lot of sense. The second thing we've seen from beauty is that, again, I, I guess this sounds redundant or overly simplistic, but what we're saying is that the focus on relevance and how a new product fits into her routines starts to become an important one. So if you think about whether I'm in mean, the cleansing portion of this or the, the treating portion or the moisturizing portion of somebody's routine, uh, you know, it becomes important to understand how this fits in with her routine and, and sort of, again, to provide cues at the shelf with the packaging, uh, with some of the POS that help, um, you know, help them when you're making those kinds of decisions. So just to sort of close out here in terms of what we uh, takeaways we had from this is really there's a couple of these things that we want to discuss for just a second here. Uh, first of all, you know, purchase can be thought of as really the culmination of the path to purchase. Shopper heuristics, you know, what we talked about are these shortcuts are, are the things that women are using to help them find the right product for me. So whether they're talking about yogurt or they're talking about um, better forming products or they're talking about skincare or they're talking about uh, beauty care, what we're starting to see that these are all things that they're trying to incorporate into how they shop, how they make a decision. Um, second thing is that um, I wanted to make sure that um, made this point is that if you think about the shelf, the shelf is one of these things that confronts consumers with a lot of choice and opacity. So you know, if we think about the this consumer when they're a shopper, this is kind of what they're confronted with. Now, granted that in some cases, like probably beauty, you probably are making fewer purchases than if you're on a, a food shopping trip. But what we see is that, you know, the, the way that, that women are starting to look at the store is less as an information source and more as a, as a, a place where they can get some cues to help guide their choice. So if you're absolutely looking for the information source, it's probably online. And that can come in a couple of ways. We could look at, you know, blog, beauty blogs, or you could, you know, look at personal reviews of those kinds of things or haul videos. But I think, you know, if you're looking inside the store, it's not so much about an information source as, you know, providing these cues to help me when I'm trying to guide, you know, guide my choice when I go through there. 
The second point we want to make about that is a rapid change in both nutrition and beauty science, right, create a need for useful cues at the shelf. So we have to update these kinds of things. And again, it's it, great to be at the leading edge of this because I think consumers would like it because this would be really useful to them if we can do this kind of thing at the shelf. Because what it does is it, it makes their life easier. It makes them, um, you know, it makes them say, you get me. It makes them, it makes them think that the retailer is thinking about them and gets them. So as you go through that, the, you know, the ability to sort of provide that kind of, you know, if you want to call it shopper advocacy, a great thing if we could do that, you know, at, at the shelf to help them with it. And finally, one of the things we wanted to just mention is that as we've gone through and studied this, We've, we've seen that the, the shelf plays two roles, and um, I guess this probably is, is kind of sounds kind of a little simplistic, but uh, one is earlier before, you know, when they're making another purchase or they're at the store for another reason, it serves to sometimes peak curiosity. So people might be browsing or they happen to pass by, and really it's about trying to get some consideration for a future purchase. Somebody might say, oh, I, I know that this product, I see this product is new, I want to take a look at it. Okay. The second, again, role is that it plays is, is when you think about the current purchase that somebody's at, and, and there it's more about um, sort of providing this guide, guide to, um, you know, uh, guided choice, if you will, somebody's going through there. So again, those, the two key things, we're trying to look at this within the, the whole context of the path to purchase, and I think we, we tried to, to show that this is really an ecosystem. You know, there are lots of things that people rely on. We've seen from places like Google and uh, Shopper Sciences that the number of touch points that people have, the number of information sources people have for things like food and beauty uh, are probably around seven or eight. So there are lots of things that they're doing inside there from you know websites and blogs to um, what's going on inside the store to the labels on the, the packages themselves. Uh, but I think when it's, it's important to understand what role um, the shelf, the packaging plays inside there. And I think, again, we've started to allude to some of the roles it can play. And, and we probably don't want to give it too heavy a burden to, uh, to do too many of these things because there are things like print and all these other things that can start to support it and probably provide some of those cues that, that ask people to look for it inside the store. Uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time and see if there are any questions at this point. Uh, so one of the questions that uh, somebody wrote is, uh, are the same types of heuristics or shortcuts uh, prevalent in other personal care categories? And I think, um, yeah, there's there's a there's a, a really good um, a lot of parallels in different categories. So if you think about how uh, people will approach something like, um, let's say, skincare, but you think about body, hand and body, okay, it's a little bit different there because it, again, it's less on it's less on uh, it's less an expression of yourself. So what you can sort of look there is you can see, yeah, I can look at healthy things, but price is going to play a larger role. And then you start to get into things like hypoallergenics and those kinds of things. So what we're seeing is that, you know, there are some personal care categories that have the same thing. Uh, some of them like general skin care, hand and body, is not as likely to have it. But we know that uh, women will look at some of the different parts of, of, of sort of their, their regimen. So there's kind of what I'll call a smile regimen, right? So they're going to take that same approach and start to look at things when they look at dental or oral products. Uh, similarly, we know that there's actually a whole series of things that women will do when they think about like their eyes and how they're going to do that. So there, there are some of these different rituals, there's some of these different heuristics that are, are sort of uh, uh, accompanying that. And so uh, women have started to develop these to sort of break through there. You can imagine what it'd be like to look at all the different shades of lipstick. And so you sort of start off with some way to sort of bring that down. Um, Second thing I think we could think about is like, what are some of the kinds of research that we use? Well, we used a, a wide range of it here because what we were doing is that really we're coming out of some of the stuff that we're trying to build on the stuff that Kathy Anetto had initially identified uh, that, that sort of um, constraints or the tension between um, what people you know want to do and what people need to do or what they're expected to do. And I think what we've seen is um, that by using a couple of different kinds of research, so we can use some survey research, which we've done both from our survey as well as some other places like Mintel and Big Insights. But really the heart of this started to come from things like uh, when we did mobile eye tracking and then we sort of uh, accompany that with what we call the retro, you know, retrospective think aloud or talk aloud, which basically 
and have somebody walk through or look at their video of themselves shopping in the store and sort of what was going through their head. So we're sort of using a combination of those two things as well as some visual salience that really helped us get a pretty good feel for what was going on for people. Um, okay, so the question is, um, do, do we see any difference in the use of purchase qualities in drugstore brands versus luxury brands? I think there's probably, there are some differences between those two. And again, I, I probably would have to land on one, but let me, let me just sort of separate out part of the difference between what I'll call, um, you know, I guess we'll just say drugstore brands versus luxury brands. So this might be a store brand or own brand versus luxury brand. Part of it has to do with the nature of how people look at these things and evaluate them. And so we see with some of the luxury brands, there is uh, less of a reason to believe on RTB inside there, and there's probably more uh, a component of desire or aspiration that sort of comes from it. So what we started to see is that the heuristic inside there is um, a little bit different because it, it's probably a lot more emotional. Just one of the points to make about this is heuristics or these shortcuts are generally not completely rational, nor should they be because that's rarely how most of us work. So we can start to see that in some categories, emotion, you can think about fragrances, or you can think about hair color, or you can think about um, makeup, right? Those are all places where, um, you know, emotion and uh, the perception about your self-image, which this is a really key part of, uh, can play a much larger role. So I think it, it starts to take on almost more uh, weight vis-a-vis -vis things like um, health and wellness. Uh, you probably wanted to do that, but you know, it's, it's starting to take on a lot more uh, dimension to it. One final point about that is we're starting to see even in the, in the cosmetics category that you'll see that um, things like cosmetics will often play multiple roles as well. So um, you, know, you can get a lipstick or a foundation or any of those kinds of things that come with sun protection or help with moisturization. So uh, they're doing a lot of things when they sort of go through there. Um, and then uh, one question is like uh, came up is is there a great great role being played by social media in um, post purchase, especially um, when we think about the loyalty loop? I, I think it is playing a large role inside here and for women especially because what we've seen is looked at uh, is certainly true of uh, of you know facial skin care and it's true of most beauty products, but it's also true of food is that first stop on almost any one of these things is going to be to go online and to start to look at it. So if you think about it, uh, one person's uh, you know review or blog or whatever you know which is based on their having uh, consumed the product and being able to evaluate it is the next person's starting point. So you can think about what's kind of at the end of one person's path to purchase is at the beginning of another. So it's playing an increasingly important role. And social media then does it in two ways, right? You can think about the fact that it, it gives us unprecedented, it gives shoppers unprecedented access to information, whether that's a review or, um, you know, insight or inspiration or about how to use it. But also it gives them unprecedented ability to influence uh, others because of their experience. So uh, it plays a huge role inside here. And I think it's, um, you know, a great, you know, social media is a very great thing we're going through and talking about any kind of product that is, you know, sort of putting the self forward. But also in terms of um, trying to deal with a complex, quickly changing kind of landscape. So nutrition and, um, you know, uh, skin care are probably two things that are like that. Great way for, for people to sort of get their hands around and try to simplify it. Any other questions? Okay, so one question is, uh, do we think that personal care products have fallen behind food brands in developing natural? Uh, interesting question. What we've seen is lots of products are coming out there that are sort of sometimes called bot botanical, sometimes called natural, um, and you can see all those kinds of things. That There are lots of them when we look at uh, new products that are coming out there. So it, it seems to be something that's coming out on a regular basis. So I, I don't know... Uh, if we could say that uh, they're they're behind the food brands in developing natural, um, but I think it probably means something different. You know, and that's probably a, one of the key things. So I think natural is one of the things we've used as a clue to um, a clue to how we could be healthier. I think what we're seeing in beauty is that increasingly there's sort of like a divide. So there's science and there's nature as sort of two roads into sort of help yourself and find a solution. And so I think. Um, 
that increasingly the folks who are working, uh, you know, in personal care or in beauty care have started to look a lot at um, this natural aspect of what's going on. Any any other question? Thank you.